Today I'm going to tell you about some applications of AstroPi in two production environments, because I think AstroPi is something that a lot of astronomers use interactively. So first I'd like to ask, how many people here have an astronomy background or have used AstroPi? Could you raise your hand? Oh, great, okay, there's a lot more, a lot more of you here than I had thought. But let me explain what is AstroPi. So the AstroPi project is a community-driven effort to gather together functionality that's useful for astronomers. And that consists of a core package of, of basic functionality. And there's also an extended ecosystem of affiliated packages that have to meet certain standards to be able to be qualified to be called affiliated packages. And there are a, a number, many of the AstroPi sub-packages are relevant for this talk. There's io.fits for the flexible image transport standard that is used commonly in astronomy. Table coordinates, WCS stands for World Coordinate System when we map pixels to celestial coordinates on the sky. Units and constants, and I'll say I'm, I'm now a maintainer for astropi.constants. I finally made it onto the team. Astropi.time and cosmology. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to the Zwicky Transient Facility, or ZTF. I'll talk about how we've used AstroPi particularly to solve problems in ZTF astrometry. I'll tell you what lessons we've learned from using it. And then I, I wanted to cover some other aspects of AstroPi in a simulation tool for the Origin Space Telescope. So ZTF is a survey that's just gotten underway in, in the last three months. We started commissioning last October. We started the survey on March 17th, and we're now releasing public alerts, alerts from the public part of the survey as of June 4th. So it's a robotic survey that's being conducted at Palomar Observatory in Southern California. On a long winter's night, we get up to 750 exposures per night. It's 47 square degrees in each exposure. And we, um, we have 16 CCDs that are each 6,000 by 6,000, each with four readouts. So we, get, so we have a 650 megapixel camera that covers a huge field of view. We process tens of thousands of images per night. The, the raw image data is about a terabyte of raw images per night. And we're producing already hundreds of thousands, up to a million alerts per night. And this all runs in a lights out automated fashion at IPAC, the IPAC data center on the Caltech campus. And we get 95% of the images through within 10 minutes after the shutter closes on the mountain. So it's transferred by uh, microwave link down to San Diego and then up to Caltech. And on the right here are fields of view for various surveys overlaid over Orion. So you get a scale of how big this is with the full moon in the corner up there. ZTF is the Zwicky Transient Facility. That's our new camera. PTF is the Palomar Transient Facility, which is a predecessor to ZTF that used um, a different a different camera from CFHT, from the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And upcoming is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that's under construction now in, in South America. And that will start its survey in three or four years from now. So ZTF has a much bigger field of view than LSST, but of course LSST has a, a much bigger telescope, an eight meter telescope and a 3.2 gigapixel camera. So we're kind of like about 10% of LSST, but we're using existing telescope facilities, so we're only about $22 million for, for this project, for about 10% of LSST. So the 48-inch telescope at Palomar has been repurposed for this. The 48-inch was originally built to take photographic plates to make objects for the 200-inch telescope at Palomar Observatory to look at. And what we've done with ZTF is to tile that whole area for these photographic plates with um, the charge coupled devices, the CCDs, like are in your smartphone. And the name of the game of ZTF for much of the science is searching for transient sources. So these three images here show what you would see in one of our alert packets, a little cutout. New is a new science exposure. Ref is a reference exposure, which is an average of many exposures taken on preceding nights. And sub is the subtracted uh, image 
showing a source that could be something like a, a supernova. So there are lots of science cases for supernovae for gravitational wave triggers, and I'll note that my colleague Leo Singer is giving it the keynote on Friday morning. He's going to talk about that. It should be very exciting. Tidal disruption events near supermassive black holes, variable stars, asteroids, and comets. And we're actually exercising the LSST alert mechanism uh, through, that the, these are all processed by the University of Washington, and I'll, I have some links at the end. That's work that's led by Maria Patterson at University of Washington. But I'm not going to talk about the alerts today. I'm going to talk about this part that was a hard problem for us to solve, which is getting good astrometry for the, for the pipeline to function. So we use the S extractor and its related suite of software. S extractor is a very popular source extractor in astronomy. Uh, SCAMP is the astrometric solver for that. And S warp is something that will let you remap your images once, once you have the proper distortion solution in them. So we've used SCAMP in the predecessor to ZTF for, for PTF. And we had problems like you see in the image at the right, where we would have good, we would have good uh, astrometry solution over most of the image, but in the corner, you're seeing double and triple stars. And so this is a reference image, which is an average of many exposures, which passed our automated quality checks, but those were obviously not sufficient for this to work. So you're seeing double and triple stars in the corner. So, and, and as you can imagine, that wreaks havoc on an image subtraction pipeline. You get a lot of spurious and bogus objects. So we wanted to, not only to improve the astrometry, but also to be able to tell very accurately um, and reject these images and filter them out when we need to. And what we settled on is making an astrometric prior to give to the SCAMP solver to help it find a good solution. So we have taking a few exposures and doing an offline fitting one time. We, we take match stars with pixel coordinates and we have accurate RAs and decks. So RAs and decks are our astronomical equivalent of longitude and latitude from the uh, Gaia mission, the astrometric mission done by the European Space Agency. We use the AstroPi world coordinate system, which normally maps pixels to celestial coordinates, but we, we, we make one with idealized one degree pixels. And we are able to convert the RAs index into C and eta, which are plane of projection coordinates. Then after some fitting, we can get pixel offsets. Those are the CRPIX1 and 2, the CD matrix, and and the uh, degrees offset at the center for each one of these 64 quadrant images on the focal plane. So I have a view graph that explains this in a little more detail. We do this calculation in a tangent plane of projection. So we take the Gaia catalog, transform things back into this C and eta tangent plane of projection in degrees on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we take our detections from S extractor, which are X, Y, and pixels, and transform them and fit this equation that you see at the top, which is really a, just a linear matrix and some pixel offsets. And ideally, those match, but in real life, there's distortions, which are 2D rep polynomials in this tangent plane of projection. So that's, that's what the SCAM solver is doing. And then those are represented in the metadata of the images. So we combine those priors with uh, the telescope pointing to make uh, in, into a header file with, um, with a distortion prior for SCAMP. So AstroPy handles those kind of header files, text files very conveniently. We also feed in our S extractor detection catalog and the Gaia astrometric catalog to SCAMP that produces a, a header file with the distortion solution in it, uh, and also a, a catalog of the detections with the right ascensions and declinations with the coordinates attached. And we feed those in to calculate astrometry metrics, including scale changes and position differences. So once we have the solution, we, we have a number of, of metrics that we calculate. Those include statistics from matching the detected stars with the Gaia reference, which we use AstroPy coordinates for. And 
and we take the, the initial header file and the prior header file and calculate the difference in pixel scale, so like the number of arc seconds per pixel between those two. And that turns out to be very, very well behaved. Here's a plot of the percent change in pixel scale as a function of air mass, that's how many atmospheres you're looking through. So if you're looking straight up, that's one air mass. And it follows a model very, very well. So this gives us a great deal of confidence that we can weed out any of these problem images where maybe just the corner, the distortion solution took off. Then another problem that we've used AstroPy to solve is for the variable star researchers, they're trying to push the detection of, of um, eclipsing sources to tens of minutes or and even less. And you have the eight minute travel time between the Earth where you took your observation and the sun. So it, to calculate heliocentric dates, you have to calculate the light travel time, which is, de which is uh, dependent on location of your source. And we have 30,000, uh, maybe up to 100,000 sources to apply this to. And it's, it's too slow to call the, the AstroPy function to do that one by one. So what we do is to use a sky offset frame. It's the similar idea to the tangent plane. A sky offset frame at the maximum RA deck because of zero crossing problems in RA. We can't just take a mean or a median. We convert the catalog to that. We, we set up a nine by nine grid and, and calculate the heliocentric travel time over that grid. And it, it turns out a, a, two, a two dimensional a quadratic polynomial works very well to solve that. So what are the lessons that we learned from ZTF? AstroPy has a lot of utilities to conveniently manage these, um, the, the inputs to SCAMP. The, where you really want to work in fitting the astrometry prior is in the tangent plane, so convert everything to that plane to do your fitting. Eliminate network calls as much as possible. So we're running this on a, 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 a slurm cluster with uh, 66 machines in it and doing um, offline processing, we can run maybe a thousand jobs at a time. So network calls are a real problem. So we prefetch the Gaia catalogs and put them in the format that the SCAMP solver needs. We also bypass some uh, network calls that are made by, for example, AstroPy coordinates, earth location of site. When you call that, it actually makes a network call to look up where Palomar is. So we hard code that sort of thing in. The sky offset frames are, are really useful for avoiding uh, these three RA of 360 to zero crossing issues. And in general, that that because we're always working in about a degree patch of sky, because that's what one of our quadrant images is. Uh, just working in a local coordinate system is very useful. And finally, it's necessary to watch out for configuration file incompatibility. So we had a problem where we, we have both Python 2 and Python 3 scripts in our system. And there's a configuration file that was randomly getting corrupted when we were running a lot of jobs. So it turned out that we had, we had different versions of AstroPy in the Python 2 and, and Python 3 virtual environments. And they were, one would overwrite the other until eventually the file corrupted. So I, I so what, what solved it was upgrading, uh, upgrading our AstroPy versions. But it, this is also a lesson for um, avoiding technical debt. We should have bitten the, the bullet and uh, upgraded everything to Python 3. <laughs> and last, I'll talk about a tool for simulating spectra from the Origin Space Telescope. So or, Origins is a infrared space observatory that's planned for the far future. It's under study along with three other concepts by NASA. And we wanted to build a simulation tool for the medium resolution spectrometer on, on that uh, mission. And we wanted to see trade-offs with telescope aperture, uh, distance to the star galaxy, integration time, and spectral resolution. And we chose Plotly Dash for
for the implementation of this, uh, of this tool. And here is where AstroPy units and AstroPy constants really came in handy for, uh, for keeping track of conversions. Because we, we were given a, an IDL routine for calculating the instrument sensitivity from the instrument PI. And there were a lot of magic numbers in it and comments in what the units were, you know, in gigahertz and erg per gigahertz and so on. So using a units package really helped to eliminate uh, having, having to keep track of that by hand. And also we were able to put assertions in the code to make sure that we were getting what we, what we needed when we had a dimensionless signal to noise ratio. We could actually check that it was dimensionless. So I really urge uh, use of a units package. And it, it really helped us out a lot. Now a new thing that I just learned about a couple of weeks ago is the YT community has come out with a standalone units package because there's been talk in AstroPy of it's generally useful so it could be split off into its own package. Well, the YT community has, has actually done that and there's a, an AstroPH paper by Nathan Goldbaum and company that came out in um, about four weeks ago. So uh, I, I think the AstroPy project is interested in talking with the YT people about how to build on top of that going forward. Because we'd like it to make it obvious, you know, there should be one obvious way to do things. For redshifting the extragalactic spectrum, what really helped was the, the AstroPy cosmology module, which has the, the Planck 2015 cosmology in it. So we use that to get luminosity d distance as a function of redshift. And then for interpolating the spectrum, that turned out to be a lot harder than I thought it would be. I, I thought there would be some other off-the-shelf things to use. But it turned out PySynFOT, which is not an AstroPy package, but the lead maintainer is an AstroPy developer who's here at the conference, although I haven't met her yet. I actually haven't met her in person, so I'm looking forward to meeting her in person. Uh, has utilities for reinterpolating the spectra, which, which turned out to be really crucial for this. So I have a movie of this tool that's online. So this is where it's in the mode of a starburst galaxy. And we can select uh, the redshift it's, and kick it out to redshift of 5. We can change the integration time from 10 minutes to an hour. We could change the background. We can lower the luminosity. And then it's, it's possible to, to zoom in. And for each of these lines, we have a, a little tip which gives the rest wavelength of the line, the species, and the signal to noise ratio and the sensitivity. So I have to say I'm very happy with Plotly Dash. Um, it, it, it's, it's worked out very well. And I'm looking forward to John Meese's talk tomorrow at 2.30 on Plotly and widgets. Okay, we saw the extragalactic gap. So what lessons did we learn from the simulation? So AstroPy units plus assertions really helped a lot to, in validating this complex function. AstroPy cosmology, very useful for getting the redshifts right. PySynFO was really good for interpolating the redshifted spectrum. Um, I do have to say I, I did have a problem just before we were debuting this tool where I had a one plus, I, I had the wrong factor of one plus z. And since z is redshift, since redshift is dimensionless, the units didn't help me out with that one. <laughs> that took a lot of painful debugging. Plotly dash plus hosting it on the Heroku app um, is, has worked out really well. We're just paying 25 bucks a month for that. And pre-computing a lot of the sensitivities sped up the app a lot. So I have a lot of collaborators on the ZTF project and the PTF project before that. These are all the co-authors from the ZTF data system paper that will be out soon. And a number of collaborators for the OST tool. And I'll leave you with a last slide with some links for more information on ZTF. The, the public alerts as a stopgap are now actually available as tar file at University of Washington. Um, there will be brokers that will make it easier to filter these hundreds of thousands of alerts to what you're interested in looking at. 
There are PASP papers that are close to submission. And here's a link for the Origins uh, Space Telescope tool. And there's also a conference proceedings paper with the links. Okay, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Does anyone have any, uh, what are your questions for David? Oh. Hi, I'm Paelian Lim. <laughs> oh, hi, okay. <laughs> So I'm um, just wondering, uh, your hard coding of the Paloma, was it? Uh, on offsite, the function that makes the network call and you bypassing it. Um, I'm just wondering if there is a more graceful way like using the AstroPy cache mechanism instead of, I don't know exactly how you bypass it, but I'm just wondering if the AstroPy caching mechanism can be of help to you. We can probably talk offline about that. Oh, okay, yeah, it, that, that probably would help, because uh, that's very useful for downloading files. I, I use it a lot for downloading files because it caches the download. Um, yeah, what we did was, was to hard code in the values of <laughs> the location of Palomar since it's not changing ever in the mission, but okay. normally you don't want to do that in your code. Also, another thing is Pi Sinfo, um, I refactor it into a different package just called Sinfo, and it uses AstroPy models and units. So I don't know if you are looking into um, transition, make that transition from Pi Sinfo to the newer package. It has all the same functionality, just the API is a little bit different, just because it use, you know, it's a mechanism, underlying mechanism is different. So we can also talk about that offline. And Sinfot is a AstroPy affiliated package. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Well, now it's worth it for me to have come all the way out of here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask: Does AstroPy have any um, astrodynamics or orbital functionality? Uh, and if not, is do you have recommendations for that in Python? Yeah. As far as I know, I. Yeah, I don't think we have. I don't think we have any orbital dynamics in it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know offhand. I don't know if. if you, yeah, I, I don't know offhand which um, which packages are good for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, and I see one more question. Oh, did I miss one? No. Uh, to answer your question, there's a package called PolyAstro that does orbital dynamics in Python based on AstroPy and AstroPy coordinates where appropriate. Okay. Well, let's thank uh, the speaker once again.